Well, welcome back to our Sunday class, Rejoicing in Lament, Crisis and Life in Christ. My name is Phil Letizia. I'm the assistant pastor here at Park Road Prez. And this is actually our final week, our last session as we wrap up this study together. Uh, Just a reminder to you that you can find all of the previous sessions uh, on our YouTube channel, which is linked from our website at parkroadpres.org. So please go back. They'll be there if you want to revisit them in the future, if you want to go back through any of them now. Uh, Today, my hope is to cover a bit of new ground as we see how uh, Todd Billings uh, kind of brings his book to a close, uh, as well as try to summarize and wrap up the entire study with some concluding thoughts. So that's our hope for today. Uh, But before we do that, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the journey that we've been on during this very uh, difficult season of our lives that we're collectively going through. God, we bring before you um, all of the things that are on our minds and hearts, uh, considering the pandemic that continues, considering the um, Lord racial unrest and the protesting and the things that have just kind of taken over our collective thoughts and imagination. God, we bring all of it before you. We trust you in it. Um, God, hopefully you are helping us through your spirit, through the study, and through the Psalms to give us language for how to uh, voice our concerns, our complaints, our laments, and find the profound hope and trust in you that we so desperately need. So God, help us now to bring this to a close. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, last week, if you recall, we said how the Psalms of lament always turn a corner. They always move from extreme complaint and protest, from crying out from a place of deep emotion. Through prayer, they move through that lament. The psalmist becomes reoriented, if you will. David often comes unglued at the beginning, and then he's kind of slowly through his prayer put back together again, more composed, and then comes to a place of profound hope. We've kind of been following that trajectory even in the weeks that we've been doing this study. And we saw last week how Todd Billings even experienced as things after the crisis were kind of settling down into life again for him on the other side of his diagnosis and medical crisis, he mentioned that he was not the same. He could never be the same person on the other side of the crisis. His life was forever changed. But he was seeing a type of restoration that can only come from basking in the love of God in Christ. This week, we come to Todd's final chapter in his book, Rejoicing in Lament, Crisis and Life. Uh, Rejoicing in Lament, Wrestling with Incurable Cancer and Life in Christ. And the title of the final chapter is, I Am Not My Own. And that phrase may seem familiar to you. The the phrase comes from this larger sentence, I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. This is from... Uh, the question and answer part portion of the Heidelberg Catechism from the first question, in fact, a confessional statement that is used by many Reformed people around the world. And take a moment to hear those words again, and I want you to think about uh, this as we hear those words again. Why do you think those words are so central to Todd's theology of hope that he's developed Why is it so central to our hope? Listen to the words. I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Billings writes this on page 170. He says, even when we feel left in the dark, even when suffering and death 
seems senseless. We are empowered by the Spirit to groan, lament, and yet rejoice. God's promise is trustworthy. And this same Spirit has united us to Christ, through whom we are able to call out to the Father as adopted children. We rejoice, we lament. In all of this, our stories are not preserved in a pristine way. We are displaced. I am not my own. And we are incorporated into a much larger story, God's story in Christ. What I think he's driving at here is that the Christian life is really a back and forth of rejoicing and lamenting. Rejoicing and lamenting. And let's reflect on that question a bit. What does it mean um, for a congregation, for a group of committed Christians who live life together? What does it mean for a congregation to expect both rejoicing and lament in their life together? What if the rhythms of our life together as a congregation actually created space to both corporately lament and rejoice, to properly celebrate and praise, but also lament and cry out. And that's why I think it's very important for a local congregation to become familiar, to create space to lament what is both happening within its own context, within its own family, but also to properly lament what is happening in the world. To not do that, to not allow for space in the worship service or in our corporate life together to properly cry out what's happening within and outside the congregation only stunts our ability to properly live and move through a broken world and find hope. You see how that works? If we don't create the space to properly lament, we stunt our ability to move through lament towards hope. A few weeks back, we read uh, this quote from Billings when he said that uh, we have this tendency in our churches when it comes to the Psalms to cherry pick the ones we want, the ones that are about praise and the glory of God and celebration and worship. And unfortunately, we skip over the dark and hard psalms of lament. This happens often, as we mentioned too, in the songs that we sing. We only want to sing the happy songs. We're tempted to leave out the songs of lament, the songs that can be actually hard and painful to sing. But if we do that, a congregational's, congregation's life is greatly affected because we cannot properly address the brokenness within our own lives and the brokenness out in the world and come through that brokenness to find hope. In other words, um, we are being shown that ultimately our hope, our only hope in this broken world is that Christ will come again. And the new life that Christ will bring when he comes in his fullness, he has given us a taste of now. And so now as we move through lament, we hold on to this foretaste of hope that affects the way we live our lives now, but also encourages us to look forward to the day when Christ comes again. So we rejoice and we lament. We rejoice and we lament, and that is the back and forth of the Christian life. In other words, I think as we read through the Psalms and what Todd Billings has been showing us and what I think he'll show us here in this last section, is that the Psalms truly invite us just to slow down as we go through this back and forth of rejoicing and lamenting, we're invited to not rush things, to slow down. He says this on page 172. This process of displacement of our old self 
and incorporation into Christ is a long journey. It is long because of the persistence of our sin, our love of life that moves away from God's ways and seeks out autonomy rather than communion with God and neighbor. But as I discovered anew during my time of recovery after the transplant, it is also a long journey because until the kingdom comes in its fullness, our lives will be ones of both rejoicing and lament before our covenant Lord. You might remember in our first few weeks that we looked at Psalm 30 a couple of times. And let me read those words to you again today. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Psalm 30 or look specifically at verses 8 through 12. But hear these words one more time. To you, O Lord, I cried, and the, and the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. In response to that psalm, Uh, Listen to Billings as he wrote in his care pages. He says this, So I'm in remission. I'm grateful to God. It reminds me of the Psalms of Thanksgiving, which recall the pleas to God that one cries out of the pit. The verses following then change tone dramatically, giving thanks for the Lord's deliverance. There are certain aspects of this movement from the pit to thanksgiving that are my prayer right now. Overall, I continue to do very well by doctor standards. I'm in remission. I genuinely and earnestly give thanks to God. But if I'm honest, I have to admit that's not the whole story about either my physical or emotional life right now. I'm giving thanks and praising God but I'm also still lamenting. Eugene Peterson notes that on the one hand, most psalms are complaints. They are calls of help by helpless and hurting men and women. Yet many individual psalms, like Psalm 30, and the book of Psalms as a whole, end with exuberant praise. Even psalms of lament and complaint usually end with a word of trust in God's deliverance. Peterson says that the fact that the book of Psalms ends in praises indicates that our prayers are going to end in praise. But that's going to take a while. Don't rush it. It may take years, decades even, before certain prayers arrive at hallelujahs, at Psalm 146 to 150. Don't rush it. If we short-circuit our continued pleas and laments, then we're hiding our hearts from God and can't fully enter into the thanksgiving and praise. I like those words. Don't rush it. Take it slow. God is bigger than cancer and our other trials, and the final chapters of our prayer will be praise. I think this is such an important point something that we should really take our time to consider. That when we go through something difficult, when a great trial or trauma visits us, typically we are so desperate to get out of that situation. We want it over so bad that when it finally does come, of course, there is incredible relief. It's past. But what we don't often realize is that the work of rejoicing and lamenting continues. Very often, those situations have lasting effects. Folks that have lived through cancer will tell you that. Yes, they had the surgery. Yes, they're now cancer-free, but they're changed. Life has changed radically, and there is much still 
to lament about what has been lost. Those feelings, the lamenting just doesn't turn off in a day. You can't just make yourself feel better or forget what you went through. In fact, very often it'll be appropriate for many of us to seek out some type of counseling or professional help to be able to take the next steps forward in lamenting after the crisis has passed. And I think the same is going to be true for the current crises that we're facing collectively. Of course, we're all looking forward to getting back to our typical lives. We're all looking forward to this pandemic passing and being over. We all want to resume worship services back here at the church and our corporate and family life together. We all want to be close to one another. And that day will indeed come. It is coming. But we need to be prepared that this crisis is going to have lasting effects, long, far-reaching effects. It has taken its toll on us, on our mental health, on our family dynamics, on um, our physical health for many, and of course, on our economic and financial situations. You don't just kind of dust yourself off and pick yourself up and just walk on into the rest of life as if nothing happened. We just pick up where we left off. I think the same is true for the racial unrest that we've been experiencing in the last few weeks. These types of circumstances, they don't just fade away. They don't go away as we're seeing. This is the ongoing situation of our culture and our country that we have been facing for centuries. They don't go away. These are markers, though, that do bring lasting change. And often, they bring much-needed change into our lives. But life will not be the same afterwards. And so we need to take it slow. We need to be kind to ourselves. We need to not rush it. We need to let God's strong medicine bring the healing that we need. We need his strong medicine to expose our independence and bring us to a greater dependence on him. Unfortunately, many of us, many Christians, I think, have been seduced into a type of religion and Christianity that doesn't allow for grief and lament and sadness. We want to rush straight forward for praise, straight for celebration. But hopefully through these eight weeks, we have uh, convinced one another that that is simply not compatible with the Bible. It's simply not compatible with the Psalms. That true and deep Christianity allows us, it allows for us to not have to live in this kind of make-believe world where everything is cake and ice cream. There is another, deeper, more meaningful way. Billings writes this. He says, a theology of the cross is not a joyless path, but one with tears of joy and celebration as well as tears of lament. Lamenting with the psalmist is a practice that is counter to our consumer culture. Lament fixes our eyes on God's promises and brings the cries of confusion and pain, our own and those of others, before the covenant Lord. It is both rejoicing and lamenting. Rejoicing in lament. And there's just two more points that I want to make, and I hope these two points will kind of serve well uh, to summarize what we've discussed in these past eight weeks. First, in the ever-increasing anxious age that we live in, all of us are finding ourselves becoming more and more calculated with our lives. 
we are tempted more and more to map out our lives, plan for every possibility, and then when things take the unexpected turn, for the worse, when crisis visits us, our lives go off of the rails because this was not part of our anxious and calculated plan. Psalm 90 speaks directly to this. Verse 10 of Psalm 90. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong. Even then, their span is only toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. But listen to what Billings says about this type of calculated life towards the end of his book. He writes this. I don't know what the future will hold, But from a statistical standpoint, it's likely that I will die several decades earlier than I would have without the myeloma. I've spent time calculating what this might mean for me, for my family, for my career. How can you plan and face the future with goals without some calculation? This is my new life. It is no use pretending that it's not here. When I take my regimen of pills four times a day, feel the daily pain of peripheral neuropathy in my feet, and give myself an injection every 12 hours, the reminders are real enough. The medical world gives cancer patients number after number, statistic after statistic, so that a person's person's lifespan and quality can be somehow expected inevitably. Cancer patients like myself experience moments of envy towards those who have been given many years. The night before traveling to my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, I experienced a sharp sadness. What are the chances that I could possibly live long enough to share that much time with Rachel? What kind of long-shot possibilities do I have to see my own children as grown adults, perhaps even to see grandchildren. But the psalmist pushes us to move beyond calculation in thinking of our lifespans. When viewing the short years of even a long human life in light of God's eternity, the comparisons between human lifespans seem absurd. Reflecting on this psalm, John Calvin says, each man, when he compares himself to others, flatters himself that he will live to a great age. In short, men are so dull to think that 30 years or even a smaller number are, as it were, an eternity. And he concludes with this thought, Billings. While death is the last enemy to be defeated, God's work is not cramped or constricted by a shorter lifespan. The everlasting God is the one who brings his kingdom in his time. And although God uses us towards that end, it is not according to our schedule. Our attempt to squeeze every second out of every day is vain if it's not entering into a much larger work, the ongoing work of God in the world. Second, and in closing, What defines us then is not our attempts to live the sort of life that will skate past suffering or avoid crisis altogether. What defines us is that we go through suffering and crisis in Christ, united to Christ, engrafted into Christ, and in fact, hidden in Christ. Because I am not my own, I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, I hope this study has been helpful to you. Um, I hope that this book has been helpful to you. If you have not yet, I would strongly encourage you to order it, to pick it up, uh, perhaps Read through it and go back to watch the sessions alongside reading through the book. But all of us are experiencing some type of crisis at the moment. 
family drama, uh, financial hardship, uh, quarantine, uh, kids not going to school, an uncertain summer, racial unrest, protesting, violence, all of it. Go to the Psalms. Go before the Lord. Bring yourself before him and cry out, lament, lament. Say that things are not the way that they should be. But God, we are looking forward to the day when you will make all things new. And when we do that, we let the love of God in Christ heal us. It is his strong medicine. Amen? Thanks so much for being with us.